The Importance of Mountains in the Bible The rapture and the second coming are two different events, and in some instances, people get these two events confused. A clear distinction between the two is that during the rapture, the Lord will not land on earth and will only be in the sky and will rapture and take his people. Whereas during the second coming, the Lord will materially return to this material earth and setting his feet on a particular mount, which we will discuss later. Mounts, mountains, and hills in the Bible have particular significance. There is something strange and unusual about hills in the Bible. Things happen a lot on hills. Let's take a walk through history and see the different significant events that took place in the hills. Noah landed his ark on a hill called Mount Ararat when the flood ended in Genesis chapter 8 verse 4. Moses experienced the burning bush on a hill called Mount Horeb in Exodus chapter 3 verse 1. God appeared to Moses and gave him the law on a hill called Mount Sinai in Exodus. Moses died and was buried on Mount Moab in Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 6. Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice on a hill called Mount Moriah in Genesis chapter 22 verse 2. Elijah challenged King Ahab to gather the idol prophets of Baal and Asherah for this meeting at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. This is where Elijah's sacrifice occurred. The transfiguration happened on Mount Tabor, Matthew chapter 17 where Jesus' body underwent a change in form, a metamorphosis, so that it shone as brightly as the sun. Jesus died the deaths of all deaths on a hill called Calvary. The atonement of all sin took place on a hill called Calvary. One of the most significant events in the life of Christ was his ascension into heaven, and that took place on the Mount of Olives. A lot of significant things happen on hills. Now today, I'm going to talk about a prophetic event that will take place on a hill. Zechariah chapter 14 verses 1 through 4. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. This passage speaks of the second coming of Christ. That day is a reference to the day of the Lord, and the one who stands on the mountain is the Lord himself. Jesus will touch his feet to the mount of the angels prophesied the return of the Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 1 verse 11 through 12 were right all along. Acts chapter 1 verse 11 through 12. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. The same place Jesus ascended from is the same place he will come again. Jesus will touch his feet on the Mount of Olives when he returns in glory with all the saints. The armies of heaven described in Revelation chapter 19 verse 14, the battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 through 21. The battle of Armageddon is the final showdown between God and evil on earth. The battle of Armageddon is the final showdown between Christ and Satan. The battle of Armageddon is the final showdown between truth and error. The battle of Armageddon is the final between showdown, light, and darkness. The battle of Armageddon is something that even unbelievers know about. Armageddon has caught the imagination of mankind, even Hollywood producers. The name has inspired books, movies, and almost endless amount of commentary. 
John saw into the future. John saw centuries into the future because God opened a door for him to see as God does. You see, our viewpoint as humans is limited. All we can see is the here and the now. We are restricted by the laws of time, but John saw thousands of years into the future, just as God sees. God sees everything. God does not only view the past and the present, but he is already viewing the future. This is why the Bible is truly the word of God and stands alone in a category of its own. No other book has the prophetic accuracy as the Bible. No other book has stood the test of time like the Bible. No man could write this book and tell us the things that will unfold in the future. God alone is the author of this Bible. And this Bible tells us that there is a battle like no other that will take place when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the battle of Armageddon. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 through 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and that set upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bound, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with his flesh. When the door was opened in heaven, the first thing that John saw was the Lord Jesus Christ. Rightfully so, there is nothing that can take your attention away from the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelations is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and there is no better way to end the Word of God than by exalting the Son of the living God. Heaven opened, and what drew John's attention is the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe me, my brothers and sisters, when the Lord Jesus Christ makes his return, he is not coming quietly and slipping quietly into the womb of a virgin and gestating for nine months. No, no, no. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he is returning in all of his glory and in all of his might, and he is coming back as a man of war. C.H. Spurgeon stated the following, He comes to fight, but the fight is for peace. He comes to destroy, but it is to destroy his people's enemies. He comes as a conqueror, but it is as a delivering conqueror who scatters flowers and roses where he rides breaking only the oppressor, but blessing the citizens whom he incapacitates. Again, I say, I scarcely like to speak upon this theme. It seems too great for me, but I would bid. The saints of God who have wept at Gethsemane now lift up their eyes and smile as they see that same. Redeemer who once lay groveling beneath the olive trees, now riding on the white horse. 
Your Lord at this moment is no more despised, but all the glory that heaven itself can devise is lavished upon him. John looked into the open vault of heaven, and he had time not only to see the horse, but to mark the character of him that sat upon it. He says he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. By this you may know your Lord. He has been a faithful and true friend to you. The Lord Jesus is coming back.